Welcome to the Directing Animation Livecast with Scott Weiser, episode 50 extended. In the actual episode, we give you a recap of my first 10 pitches in 10 minutes, and then a short version of the five newest pitches to total 15 pitches in five minutes. And the host of this conversation was Kevin Lima, who directed a goofy movie, Tarzan and Enchanted and more. And he was so kind to give me these reactions in real time. So if you want to watch the shortened version, you know, we'll have a link at the end that you can click or you can click uh, the link down in the show notes. But until then, let's go and start this extended conversation with Kevin Lima. So yeah, let's just begin with Anti-Spy. You want me to read the logline? Yes. Okay. Howard, the sleekest cleaner in the spy industry, fails to save an intriguing woman, only to see her coming back to life again and again. There we go. What do you think? <laughs> <laughs> this, you know, I we've I read the five that you sent me. Uh -huh. This one seems to be the most thought out as far as structure and plot. Yes. To me. Some of the others are about like, okay, this is an idea that I'm exploring and it could go in this direction or maybe this that direction. This one feels like you've put a lot of time into the plotting of both the structure and the character growth. Yes, absolutely. And this was when I did that those for original pitches, and I had people vote. This yeah. was the this was one of the top picks. Okay. And, and this time again, this was the landslide. So I've had a bit of time to think about it. The first time it was in the round of voting, I didn't really love it. <laughs> and okay. Actually, remember how I told you I put nothing in the running? The film called Nothing. Yeah. Uh, this was the one that was sitting behind it that I knew had ranked, oh. but I also really wanted to develop nothing and it was worth it because that has risen as one of the top of those five pitches. And okay. so, yeah, this one's just kind of sat around for a while and uh, luckily I had p enough people to challenge me on it too because I had one way it was going. It was a little yeah. too much like Spies in Disguise, the animated film that's already out there. Oh, right. And I right, wanted nothing right. to do with the, you know that animated film. So, yeah. I like the animation huh. in it, maybe, but you know, I didn't want to do the same story, obviously. So. so, let me ask you: So, you did the same thing this time around, where you took these five pieces and you kind of workshopped them in a way. Yeah, and I even did okay. the fifty pitches again. Like, I came with fifty log lines, narrowed them down to ten, had people vote, and then narrowed them down to five, and then continued to develop them. So, over the course of these fifteen pitches, you actually put together a hundred pitches. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's crazy. That's crazy. I don't know anyone who's ever done that. Yeah. And I'm doing more <laughs> I figure for these next five. So I have 20, you know, because it's kind of 10% yeah. of your ideas are good. And so I've got to whittle them down, you know? Right. Um, although right, right. in this round, all of them, I think are going to make it to the next round. So the five that didn't make it of those 10 pitches are going to be in the voting of the next round because I think my ideas are getting better. And it's like I'm planting okay. little seeds as well where, you know, things are, things are growing over time that I didn't expect right. to grow, you know, right. by right. developing all these I'm, ideas. I, I'm always surprised at the things that, that hold on. Yeah. Right? Because I'm always writing. I've, I have a little book here that I keep that I... I'm always writing stuff in it, like uh -huh. anything, anytime an idea comes to mind. And I'm surprised by how constantly things come back. Things that I thought of when I was in college. Yeah. Are still like scratching away. And sometimes they come forward and take a big step. Sometimes things that I said, oh, I'm never going to do that, you know? Yeah. Actually holds on and becomes the thing that, that you know, takes takes first place, takes the front seat. That's wonderful. So, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I think the thing that excites me most about this project is, again, I'm not a big fan of spy movies. I like the premise. Like, I like the trailer. Yeah. I, I like kind of what I think I'm going to get from a spy movie, but then I jump into the film, I watch it, and I, I end up disappointed, you know? <laughs> I mm -hmm. expected something a bit more dynamic, something a bit more mysterious you know something a bit more like the incredibles honestly and you know right we discussed in the essay about how 
Goldfinger inspired the look of The Incredibles and actually some beats and kind of some yeah. some of the things they have in The Absolutely. Incredibles. Uh-huh. Um, so I want to take those things that I really imagine will happen in a spy movie and make that into an actual movie, a, a spy right. movie that I would love to right. see. So, one you know one of the things you bring up in the in the treatment in the essay as you call it yeah. um, is that the death toll of these movies seems to be getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Yes. <laughs> and I think that's become maybe a little bit of the, of the spark of where this idea sort of came from, right? Because he's a oh, cleaner. Absolutely. He's someone who has to clean up after yeah. the spy has done his business, mm-hmm. right? Yes. Has caused the havoc. Yes. And then he has to come in and put everything right. Right. Yep. And he's so good at that, you know, and always kind of egging the other agents on that they kind of would like him to be a spy and say, oh, you know, prove your zero damage theory. You know, can you, uh-huh. can you, is that even that? possible? That's that impossible. Even, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and so, yeah, it's, it's a fun exploration and I'm excited to make it someday. How, you know, how, how extreme are you thinking about the portrayals of the characters in something like this? Are they, are they overly theatricalized? Like, is he like, 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 like you call him a cleaner and he's obsessed with order and cleanliness. Uh-huh. Is he a germaphobe in that sense that he is so out of his mind that everything has to be perfect? Or is he obsessed with a job well done? I think so far I'm, I'm more on the job well done. We won't go as far as Monk, right? So Monk's about right. okay. uh-huh. a man, an, an obsessive compulsive man. We're not going to go there in this story. Yeah. Maybe in Tales of the Obsessed, which we'll read soon. But right. uh-huh. we're not going to go there in this story. This will be more of a naturalistic type of story. Uh, I want the characters to feel really grounded and real. Right, right. And so, I mean, also, you know, one of the things I was, I was sort of attracted to in reading it was the idea that there's something right in front of your face that you don't see. Yes. Right? Yes. There's a relationship at the center of this piece that he that he cherishes, but he doesn't see. Yes. Right? And not until he, he's, he's forced to go through this idea of zero mess is he able to then sort of come to terms with and embrace what's right there in front of him. Yeah. A mess that's right there in front of him, right? Yeah. In a sense. And the beauty that's right there in front of him and the answer that's right there in front of him. And uh, actually, I've had experiences with this, with this recently, a, a kind of a deeply spiritual experience, you know, mm-hmm. of something I was missing all along. And, and I actually, it was through writing it down that I was able to see my flow of consciousness and actually see the thing that my brain just keeps editing out. And that was the thing that I most needed to know, you know? Yeah. <laughs> so, Yeah. 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 Most people don't learn that until they're in their 70s. <laughs> <laughs> well, good. <laughs> I'm uh, uh, glad to be maybe a little tiny bit ahead of the curve. So, all right. We want to move on right. to the next one. Sure. If you're ready to move on. Yes. Sweet singing sugar. <laughs> okay. Here it goes. Logline. Spearmint Gummy, the top song and dance superstar on Candy Cloud takes an unexpected nosedive into the dingy land below where she meets salty, sour, savory characters who challenge her naive outlook on life. How autobiographical is this? I don't know. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, I mean, it kind of is in a way. I grew up in a generation where, you know, I'm a little bit before the participation trophies, but okay. I, you know, I had teachers who really thought I was a genius, you know, <laughs> and would treat me as such, would give me extra homework. And, you know, and then I had a period of struggle, but then I quickly emerged from that period of struggle from getting F's and D's in school and came back into this zone where people just kept telling me, you're going to be a star, you're going to be amazing, you're going to be awesome, right? And then I confronted the reality of, oh, you know, there are other people who are told all their lives they are going to be talented and amazing and wonderful. You know, how most you- of the time you all co- congregate in a place called college. <laughs> <laughs> Something would happen to me. You know, I was in high school. The same story. You know, not the not the fall and rise within high school, but I was an artist, right? So my mm-hmm. art teachers were like, "Oh man, you're incredible. You got to take this. You got to do this. You're going to make something with this. You're going to be great." And then you go to school. And every single kid who was told the same thing in their school 
we're all in the same place together. Yeah. And you realize, oh, wow, I'm not the one superstar. Right. Exactly. Now there's 30 of us sitting here in a classroom. Together. Yeah. And then you get into the animation industry and. Well, yeah. How, who can count them? You know? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and I actually was at the top of my college. I was in the top five percent of my university. Um, yeah. In as a junior, they inducted me into the top, you know, Phi Kappa Phi organization, and okay. so you know, I, I thought everything was going to go for me, and it didn't. <laughs> you know. So here you so 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 you do relate to this then. In a way, yeah. In some ways, right? Yeah. In some ways, you've got you've, you've got some some stake. Yes, in the I, story. I also thought it was about time that I did a musical. Or <laughs> I have one musical in the lineup. You right? already have a musical. <laughs> yeah, but, but in 20 pitches, you've got to have at least two musicals, you know? <laughs> two. Tell so, that to my wife. <laughs> um, <laughs> there you go. <laughs> who, who, who hopes that she never has to work on another musical ever again. Yeah, yeah. So. <laughs> but uh, unlike the unsingable song where she starts out as dreaming of being a superstar, I thought it'd be fun to start out as a superstar and see what comes after that, you know? Right. Especially right, right. in this influencer economy where we have so many superstars, you know, what comes after that? What's the meaning of life when you've lost your, you know, I've worked with a YouTuber. <laughs> and uh -huh. uh, what's the meaning of life you've after lost you've lost your audience? Your subscribers, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so, yeah. 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 What what brought a, the location of this story? Where did that come from in your head? Um, well, I've a world made of candy. Right? I've seen this done, right? We've seen it done in other films where candy is a subject, like in Wreck It Ralph, right? Mm -hmm. I thought it would be important, like in Wreck It Ralph, the whole world is made of candy. I thought it'd be important to actually make the characters out of candy, because that right. brings in a whole new perspective to things. And the world would be more like a display case, right? <laughs> where this is where the candy the is. Plastic? <laughs> yeah, it's made out of like levels that Plast are clear plastic okay. and, and uh -huh. you know, wrapping. Cellophane. And, and, yeah, different types of things like that. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. So, I worked on, on Candyland for Hasbro. Oh, yeah? I developed Candyland for them for a while. So I am I am very well versed in this world <laughs> where everyone is made out of candy. Every yes. the whole world was made out of candy in mine. Anything that was organic or 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 structural, architectural was all made out of candy. Right. So so I've been down this road a little bit. I also don't want it to be a, a candy advertisement though, because I you know yeah. I'm all about health and, and exercise and eating properly, and so making a a musical about candy, I'd also be very cautious. So that's why we leave Candy Cloud and go right. into a world where there are other things. There are right. savory characters, there are sour characters, there are salty characters. You know, there's a character made of root, roots and dirt, you know, uh -huh. <laughs> who ended up uh -huh. becoming one of my favorite characters in the story. So, right. yeah. So not a candy commercial, but we will play in that zone. Maybe it's, maybe it's sweet. I mean, in that she meets characters who are salty, sour, and savory, mm -hmm. right? Which suggests character types. Yes. Yeah. Right? Why couldn't sweet do the same thing? Right? And I think that's what you're going for, is that she's, that she's naive and sweetness and light and full of joy. Yeah. Right? Yeah. As I was as, as a child going trick-or-treating and thinking this bag of candy was going to be, bring me joy. <laughs> <laughs> and, all, and all it got you was a, 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 a tummy ache. Yes, exactly. <laughs> I was also thinking for this one that the poster, you notice the poster is very pastel and lots of colors. Yeah. With, I think if we ever did make this film, you know, there's that one hand in there that's like decaying. <laughs> right. And, yeah, yeah. You know, kids' eyes go right to that like, oh, Oh, what's, what's wrong, wrong with, with the hand? You know, I think there would also be good in marketing to do a poster that's all dark and then you have the pop of candy, you know, right, that, that would be right, fun right, to right. kind of show that this film's not going to be all sweet and pastel and for little girls, you know, there's going to be uh -huh. some depth in there for adults and for boys and for everybody else. So, right, right. Yeah. Talk a little bit about, you know, I was interested when you were, when you were talking about the music mm -hmm. in the essay and you said, I still feel that it needs several revisions. Uh -huh. And I was like, oh, this is an interesting idea because, because what we always tend to forget is that these things go through many revisions. And in yes. fact, I'd say screenplays and stories are rewritten, not written. 
Yes. Right. Absolutely. And it's in the rewrite process that you discover all the depth, all the connective connected material in which you throw things out and you pull things in and you tighten things up and you make big discoveries. And, you know, I've often said to people who, who feel like they've handed me a piece of gold, right. And it's their first draft. <laughs> I have to, I have to sort of say, you know, before we get into this, you, you have to agree to trust the process that there's a process here. <laughs> Yes. And you, if you want me to tell you what I think, then you have to be willing to listen mm-hmm. and take that on. And, and it seems like even in your, in your writing of these pieces, you're saying, I know that there are going to be revisions and revelations and things that are going to be learned along, along the way. Yes. Yeah. It's also especially true of music, right? When you add music to something, it's... It's part of the rewrite process. Adding yeah. a song can tell you something about the piece that you, re- you weren't thinking about to begin with. Absolutely, yeah. Well, and as we know, you know, when we first recorded that video, I had two of these, and now I have three, you know, books right. that are uh-huh. out. And then I have the unsingable song that has been pitched around and almost funded completely, almost greenlit. And that's cool. we keep getting closer and closer each time, so that's wonderful news. And, and writing, are there many revisions along the way to get you to this place of almost being? Of course there are. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> There's something right. unique about music, though. I think that music is this force all of its own, you know? Um, mm-hmm. I was listening to music yesterday while I was on a long drive and just floored with how that's, the music touched me in a way. You know, it, it tells... It, there's another element to that. It, it is kind of almost transcends storytelling in a way where mm-hmm. you, you can't quite articulate what's going on in that music, you know? And so as I add music to the project, suddenly it, it sparks things that I, I wouldn't maybe have allowed my subconscious to release, you know? Right. And right. so I when you think- say music, are you speaking mostly of music or lyrics and music? What, what are you talking about when you, when you say that? I think I would be, because lyrics are storytelling device, and I use yeah, them there. Yeah. yeah, it would be more They're like... a narrative device, right? It'd be more like, what would happen if we, at this part of, of the movie, put in a sad song? You know, this is a, supposedly a happy part of the movie, but what happens if we put in this sad song? You know, what does that do to the dynamic of the story? And I think that's one area where the musical theater genre is unique, where you have all different types of songs that you try to put into this, this show to see what happens. And it, it inspires things. I, I think of Singing in the Rain, too. Singing in the Rain was right. one of those spaghetti musicals where they just threw a bunch of songs together and it made something magnificent happen. I think that is a hard way to do things. So uh-huh. I'm going to stay open to it, but I think we would generally follow you know, story structure first and then if the music inspires something that the subconscious wasn't releasing through story, maybe we're being too overstructured, we add music and it changes something in, in our hearts and minds, then I would be open to that. Right, right. Yeah. Right. It also has the way, it, it, you know, music and lyrics can, can create economy of storytelling. Yes. In yeah. a way that a scene cannot. I think about the opening of Tarzan. Mm-hmm. The amount of story we told in the opening of Tarzan while we were telling you thematically what the movie was about. Yes. Yes. was kind of amazing because it didn't have to be that the characters were actually singing the lyrics yes. in order for two things to become one thing that was greater than right. either piece. You also right? did that in a goofy movie and in Enchanted <laughs> to give you credit, I think. You well, know. thank you for that. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Yeah, I actually saw a whole video essay about how the opening scene of a Goofy movie was just like the mastery they had done in Beauty and the Beast. How they were just really dialed in and strong, just started that thing. I'll have to bang. listen to this. Yeah, it was a really good essay on a Goofy huh. movie. It was fantastic. That's interesting. <laughs> so, That's yeah. interesting. Which was also <laughs> a musical, you know? It absolutely was. And it used music. it uses music in many different ways, right? Yes. It's Absolutely. just not, it doesn't all just come from characters breaking into song. Right. Right, which is important to remember. I mean, some of my favorite films, I really love the music. And I love yeah. what they did with it. And it brought something extra, some gravitas, you know, to right. the storytelling that without it wouldn't have been there. And I think music is so important. Yeah. 
where audio I don't think I know how to do it any other way, to be quite honest with you. Yes, absolutely. I, I want to make everything a musical. Like I said earlier, it drives my wife crazy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Me too, in a way, but uh, yeah. So when you say, you know, you have to have at least two musicals, I laugh at you, but I would probably do the same thing. Yeah. <laughs> I believe it. I believe it. And it, honestly, at some point, some of these might become musicals that weren't planned on being musicals, and that will be fine and wonderful. You know, right. I'm open to it. So, awesome. Let's move on to the next film. Oh. All righty. Super, which is spelled S-O-U-P apostrophe R. <laughs> and you'll soon find out why. Yes. In a quest to feed his village, a boy named Chingy wishes for the power to make food out of thin air. But those who eat his food lose the ability to see, hear, or touch him. Where does this come from? Where did this idea come from? Because usually, you know, food is something that that brings something, is additive, right? Mm -hmm. Gives you energy, gives you life. This food takes something away. Yes. Right? It does. Well, at least for one person, only from the chef, right? right? It gives to uh -huh. everybody else. I went through Brandon Sanderson, the New York Times bestseller. I'm good friends with his art director, and he often recommends Brandon Sanderson's lectures, you know, and he's a New York Times bestseller. So, um, but he's a book, so I kind of ignored it for a while because I'm interested in screenwriting. But then when I listened to his lectures, I found out how much depth there were to them that works right. for all of storytelling. And one of the things he said about magic is the thing that's interesting about magic isn't the magic itself, it's the limitations. Right. So as I was developing many different ideas that I was going to narrow down and have people vote on, uh, this was one that just really struck me. I just, I felt like this could both be warm and nurturing to the soul, but it also could really be a challenge, you know, to see this character who gives so freely of himself so that his village can can eat right and then what comes after that like but the sacrifice ultimately is that he loses identity right he he disappears yes which is kind of the that's kind of the mortal fear that's why we're so afraid of things that happen on social media is because we human beings we we know that if we are cast out of society that would mean death in some you know, civilizations. And so even something as far as like an argument on social media has great weight on our psychology as human beings. And uh, it's, it'd be, I think it's rooted in that, the idea of being mm. cast out of society and being separated because humans need each other to survive. Uh -huh. If you were, if you, you know, one of the things I, when I was reading all this, I was thinking, okay, what is the metaphor behind this? What is he trying to get to? What is the truth? behind the piece. That's what always is the most interesting piece of it to me is what is the truth? Yeah. Are you thinking that's what it is? Is it about losing a part of yourself and how, and what that means and how you recover from, from loss? You know, the interesting or, thing about the stories yeah. that I write, they often are like little time capsules for the future. <laughs> this is really interesting, but, um, I tend to be going some, through something when I'm working on a certain project that I didn't anticipate I was go, be going, going to be going through, and the truth emerges from that. Hmm. So I think I haven't gotten to the bottom of the truth. I think it is rooted in the idea of being cast out of society. It is rooted in the idea of giving, you know, and, and what that costs a person to give. And uh, luckily, the, the story is going a to person, have a happy or what ending. A person, or what a person believes that will cost. Yes, that's right? true, too. Yes, yeah. Right, because giving, you know, that well is always refilling itself. But there must, you know, there, since so few of us give, there must be some deep fear that giving means that you lose something. Yes, absolutely. Um mm. I, you know, I, I was at a certain point where I kind of turned down some opportunities I dreamt of in animation for a long time. Yeah. And one of the reasons was because I was working on my own stuff. But that, yeah. that is only a, a, a shallow reason compared to my real reason of wanting to take care of my family, right? And, and the cost seemed huge at that point to me. Um, but over mm. time, 
I have seen beautiful things emerging from that decision. Uh, same with my wife, who decided to be a stay-at-home mom in, right. in a zone where there aren't very many of her left. Uh, right. even, uh, even in our state where a, a common religion encourages that, you know, Right. And or at least the culture of that, that religion encourages right, that. So right. um, it's interesting that as a society, we also tend to tend to look at homemakers and, and, and we force invisibility upon them. Yes. Right. We think of them as not being as worthy. Yes. Right. Mm -hmm. Which is ridiculous. Yeah. In so many ways, because they're doing the greatest work of all the giving that they are that they are doing. The growing that they are doing is the most important work yeah of all hmm. absolutely and and my wife still wrestles with that like is this is this worth it you know right. and and it's been hard for me to grapple with that and to kind of in a way that isn't like i'm the man you go work you know <laughs> right uh no i right. i go work you stay home you know um i, I don't right. do that you know it's it's always been a conversation where we decide together what we're going to do and uh I'm in awe and in reverence of every time she right. decides, you know, I'm going to make the decision for my family, which I think gave me right. power, you know, when big studios were calling. And, and I, I love the studio I work at now, so I, I wouldn't trade that for anything. Um, but uh, yeah, big studios, how can I turn those down, you know? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. This yeah. seems to very much be a, a, maybe one of the most personal not personal for you, but personal for the character in that, yes, there are big things happening outside of them and around them. Their actions are causing, you know, I, I mean, I mean, actually they're, 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 they're creating great joy, Yeah. but the personal cost is huge. Yeah. So the character has to go on a very solitary journey. Mm-hmm to ultimately discover how to come to terms with what is happening because yeah. of their actions. Their actions are, are very positive. Yeah. Right? He could feed the world. Yes. Absolutely. Right? But at a great cost to himself. Mm -hmm. And the coming to terms with that feels like it's, it, it is a very, very character, singular character journey. Yeah. Also, you, as you read in the pitch, there was one of the early readers who, you know, as she described her experience reading this pitch, broke into tears. Right. And, and talked about right. how much she wants to see this movie and, uh, and how it's already started healing as she watched her children lose their father. You know, right. so, yeah. Yeah, excited to do it. Yeah. Excited to explore it more. Lots Personal of Personal loss is a, is, can, can be a very moving experience whether it be in life or in art in film absolutely absolutely cool great thoughts thank you let's go on to tales of the obsessed this one scares me <laughs> here we go four of the most passionate people in the world end up in a warped pocket universe where their obsessions collide in explosive ways tell me why it scares you You use a lot of like powerful words that like explosive and collide <laughs> and warped and passionate, which are all very strong, obsessed even. Uh -huh. These are all very charged words. <laughs> and when you put them together in such a short and a single sentence, I think this, right? It um that sentence starts to vibrate for me. I've read the idea, mm -hmm. right? And I can say that this is very much, I think, how you describe it. This is an idea that's in search of a structure to bring all the pieces together. You have a lot of pieces vibrating mm -hmm. against each other. Mm -hmm. And I think you said that it was originally four separate ideas. Stories, yes. Stories that you, that you kind of pulled all in together a row. into one. As well. Yeah. I wrote them down all in a uh, row and had no idea. Like, I, I was obsessed with obsession. <laughs> you know? Yeah. 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 And so, it's, and so it's interesting to see you work through trying to weave these individuals, 
push them against each other and see how they, the sparks that fly mm -hmm. and placing them together. I think that maybe of all your ideas, this is the one that could go in so many different directions. Mm -hmm. And as you explore it more deeply or pull it together, mm -hmm. the characters are interesting. Right. Each one of them in and of themselves are interesting. Yeah. And so it will be, it'll be interesting to see how, if this one takes on life beyond this pitch, where it goes, how it, how it continues to grow. Yeah. I think uh, Miyazaki has come out of retirement again already. <laughs> you know? Again. Right, yeah, yeah. Right. And made a film just barely. Um, I think this would have to be something like that. You know, that after years, you know, the people of me proving to myself and the audience that I can tell great stories that move people, then we can explore something like this, you know. So I'm putting it in the running, not thinking it's going to get greenlit early on, you know. I'm putting mm -hmm. it in the running thinking mm -hmm. this is something that vibrates, right. like you said, um, that's exciting. We'll see. We'll see what happens with it, you know. Right, and, and I right. told you I had one friend who will honestly tell me whatever he thinks about my pitches. <laughs> you know, he's like, yeah. I don't get this one, you know. And it was granted in an earlier draft, but he said, I think there's more going on in the four inches between your ears than on the page here, right? And I loved, I loved the answer I had right in that moment where it was like, oh, I think there's more going on in the next four years of my life <laughs> than on the page, you know. Uh -huh. And it was kind uh -huh. of what I was talking about earlier where – these stories contain something that I don't right. understand yet. And I, I think those are the best stories in a way. Are Do you consider yourself discover? obsessed? Absolutely. <laughs> How what, else do you uh, come up with 100 pitches? <laughs> I know that was a leading question, right? Um, <laughs> has this been... Are you aware of your obsession? It seems like you are. Becoming aware in this round pitches yeah more aware okay yep and some amazing experiences have, says have had it and i have thorough notes that i'm taking on like what the experiences are and what what comes out of those experiences that you know i'll review if we ever do want to make this film right right i thought there were two of these characters that when i read them reminded me of you okay one was fletch uh-huh the, because he's a graphic designer. Yeah, and, and I, I started know, out. I know, yeah. And you started out that way, right? And designed the, the logo for Twas, and that you was did. a fun process, yeah. You did. And, um, and Brian, <laughs> because I know he's, he's the musical theater nerd, because I know you have begun writing music, and right? That's, that's, a, that's been something that you really love. You want to make these things into musicals. Yeah. And if you give and me a word, I can give you a song. You know, uh -huh, <laughs> my kids do uh -huh. that all the time. So yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I annoy people with that all the time. It's like <laughs> someone will say something, and I'll just break into a Sondheim song, and they'll be like, "Kevin, just, I don't have no idea what you're singing." <laughs> they have no connection to it. But I was wondering. It made me wonder. I mean, I don't know if Jillian or Harry, the two other characters in this, how they relate to you. But it made me think: Are all of these characters part of one person? Are they all part, like I was thinking about you, uh -huh. like, are they all part of Scott? I'm not a daredevil. They, I know you're not. <laughs> I know you're not. So I was looking for, so what is the thing about this character that's, that might be Scott? But I, I, I don't know. It just made me think of, oh, you know, we don't only have one obsession in our lives, right? Mm -hmm. We have many obsessions. Mm -hmm. And cracking that into four people in the surprise of that what you've been watching is really the pieces of, you know, one person. Yeah. I don't know. It just, it just, it just struck me. I mean, it makes sense. If you, if you properly structure a film like Hamlet, you know, everybody in that story is an extension of, of Hamlet in a way, right. you know, right, right. they're and, all part uh, of his psyche. Yeah, yeah. They're all part of his psyche. And that's kind of what we're, Wrestling. As I told you, I'm reading Carl Jung, and and he has quite the psyche, you know, <laughs> that he's, <laughs> he's going through. It's, um, I never expected right. to laugh as hard as I laughed in this book, but, <laughs> you know, he's, really? he's a very fascinating guy. He's kind of wrestling against himself, in, and 
and the world at large in the story, you know, in, right. the, in his own right. biography. So, yeah. Right, right. Now that's yeah. interesting. Yeah. And thank you that's for your observations. It's really fun to talk about it. Perhaps as I go to read this film, I'll, re I'll review this interview, you know, <laughs> and, uh, and say, oh, yeah, I remember how Kevin had these cool insights because, you know, as, as no, we all know. You wanted, a, you wanted a conversation, right? Yes, yes. <laughs> With somebody I admire, and I, I admire your work. Oh, so, Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you. Yeah. So the last one here. The last one is called Half. Or in other words, Masked Magic 2. Which was interesting to me because when I when I saw that, I first was, I, I started to analyze this piece by thinking, is it a book or is it a film? <laughs> and I started, to, if it's a film, then how does it exist without knowing the first story? But then when I read through this, I said, oh, okay, this is pretty self-contained. You don't need to know the first story in order to. Mm -hmm. um, like any good sequel, right? Yes, absolutely. I'm not inclined right. to do sequels, right, by the way. Um, this was an idea that somebody said should be attached to Mass Magic 2, and I didn't like the idea until I actually experimented with it, and I thought, oh, it grows. It grows right. rapidly. There's something here. So, right. yeah. Right. You haven't, you, you haven't mined the depths of that, uh, of that idea yet. Right. Fully, exactly. right? Yep. Okay, here's the log line. After defeating the mask maker, whose magical masks granted wishes, but stole the kid's actual identities, Ava and her friends confront a new challenge. Jin's soul splits in half in a new breed of magical masks that seem impossible to remove. Become a reality. <laughs> that is a, a period, uh, sentence that needs to be finished. <laughs> <laughs> Did you notice the dangling there that happened at the end? <laughs> I, I I was dang. I read it a couple of times already. I thought, okay, I don't I don't quite know how to end this, but yes. that's why we're talking. Yes. Um, it what happens when Jin's soul splits in half is we have this half that is good, completely good, no evil yeah. in it, and we have a half right. that is completely evil, and this evil is able to create a new breed of magical masks that cannot be removed, at least seemingly. <laughs> right. So right, right. Um, in the first book, what we had were these masks that you could remove them at will, you know? Okay. And because the masks were addicting, then the mask would gradually steal your actual identity. But in this one, you can't remove it. It's stuck there. So the consequence of trying this, um, as, as you read in the outline, I didn't realize uh, in Mass Magic that it was a story about addiction until I was finishing the book. I didn't realize yeah. that reviewers of the book would be reco a recovering addict, you know, who found meaning in the book and was able to kind of heal a bit more from his addiction by reading the book, which is amazing. So, wow. yeah. So there are some things that you try in life that once you try them, they're so strong, it seems impossible to remove. And so that's what we're beginning right. to, we're no longer in the mild addictions, we're in the strong, strong, strong addictions. You're in meth. Yes, yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's interesting to me that, that this becomes a subject or an idea that, that, that grows from a book that you really didn't have that intention. Addiction was not something you were thinking about when mm -hmm. you wrote yeah. Mask Magic. Yeah. But yet, others look at the work and see something in it that is so evident mm -hmm. to them. Yes. Huh. But I imagine that maybe kind that's of... maybe that's where this sequel comes from in some ways, right? Uh -huh. Is is the revelation that wow, this was this was brewing, and I had no idea it was there. Yeah. Now I know it's there. Yeah. So I can explore maybe something in in a, a deeper, more knowledgeable, knowing way. Yeah. But in a way, I kind of know I'm still, you know at ground zero where there are things to be discovered that I will discover that I don't right. know are going into the story. But I think when you're honestly pursuing an idea, uh, you're just going to discover things that you didn't 
anticipate discovery. Right. Otherwise, you're making propaganda. Otherwise, you're making, you know, a lecture, you know. But if you're mm -hmm. making drama, I think things just emerge from that you didn't expect. Right, right. Yeah. I can only assume that, that these are not things that, I mean, I know you. So I'm assuming these are things that don't really live in your life in that way. You might be maybe addicted to video games, but I don't media. think you've ever been <laughs> social media, but uh -huh. I don't think you've ever been addicted to heroin. No, um, not on that level. <laughs> so, so it's, it, I mean, it's, it's interesting that, that the subject has, has risen from the exploration of, of, of masks. Yeah. Right. It's something about me that's interesting that we've never discussed is um, I tend to be a person who, once somebody gets to know me just a little bit, they start telling me their life story. Hmm. And, uh, and I somehow am going through something right then that I'm like, I'm going through this thing too. And so I can give you some little, at least breadcrumbs from the trail that's going to lead you to healing. Um, and it's become more and more common as life goes on that I've actually been able to help people in a more profound way, in a, in a faster way, you know, which is also contained in the story, right? We have the, the pure side of Jin uh, can actually heal people in a way from the masks and starts to discover ways to get the masks removed. Of course, when well, you remove the one addiction, another one forms. But uh, right. yeah, it's, uh, it's a very interesting mm. thing to explore. Right. So I think that's part of it is my desire to, to help. Um, it becomes stronger and stronger as time goes on. And as my love for people deepens, you know, it's like, oh, we actually can maybe help each other along the way. Uh -huh. um, and not in a condescending way either, you know. I think, I think maybe, maybe there are some, you know, as you're talking here, I'm thinking maybe there are some similarities between Super and this story in a way. Yeah. Right? The idea of helping, the idea of giving. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> and there's definitely a fear there, right? If you give too much, where are you going to pull the rest from to give, you know? Right, right. Yeah. There's one thing I found interesting in the, in the, in the, in the essay, in the, you know, the treatment where you started talking about um, that as you grow as a filmmaker, that you find words less and less sort of necessary. Yeah. Which is an interesting idea because I've always said, and, and it's something that we've always said in animation is show don't tell yes right that yeah. is a common hammer that we use in a way that modern filmmaking and, and modern screenwriting doesn't allow uh-huh right because yeah. modern screenwriting is is more like playwriting in that the screen the characters have to tell you everything mm -hmm. the way in which movies get greenlit is not based on subtext no. Or the visual language that is going to tell the story. It's based on what characters can say. And I'm always like, how do we translate this idea, this intellectual idea, into something that's actionable? Yeah. Right? As opposed to something that's just about how characters talk to each other. Right, right. And I think it takes time to start to see it. Um, you know, in watching great films and that sort of thing. I'm, and making mm -hmm. mistakes on my projects, right? Where in with this recent uh, experience of pitching uh, the unsingable song to a group of blind people that I not, they're not blind physically, but they don't know me, you know, they've never yeah. seen it. No, they no, have no, no idea. They have no connection or desire or anything with the project. They're just seeing it and, and deciding how disappointed they would be if it weren't made. Right. Suddenly I'm like, I put that out there and I knew exactly what was wrong with it. You know, <laughs> like oh, I really? knew in the back of my mind, there's this problem. There's too much talking. This is too much about the mother. This is like, there's so much that's wrong with this. And, it, I, you know, it was a very painful experience to, to put that in front of the audience, but it also was a very, like, it opened my eyes to what I need to know, which is right. how do you put two images next to each other and have them tell you something that they wouldn't tell you alone. Right. And uh, of course, how do you then pitch that to an executive? I think that's more of what you're talking about because screenplays are kind of written for executives in a way. They're like, how? They absolutely are. Yeah, yeah. They, they are the guardians of the green light. But the stories that last and the films that we really want to watch over and over again have the subtext, you know? Right. They're, they're the ones that put images together that 
suddenly give us something we didn't expect. Right. I'm often, I, I, I found that as a, as a live action director, I was often more interested in what the, the listening character was doing. Yes. Yeah. In that I would pay more attention to that reverse. What is, what is the character doing when they're listening? Yeah. Are they comprehending? Are they present? Are they thinking about something else? Mm -hmm. You know, where are they in that conversation? Um, and often it becomes the key to a scene. Yeah. And suddenly that scene's more meaningful, right? And yeah. I think you did that really yeah. well. I remember hearing your commentary on Enchanted that you can find on YouTube, right? That's right, where it's right. located. And uh, mm -hmm. I loved your insights there of like, you were talking a lot about that, that process of saying, okay, we have dialogue here. Okay. It's, it's dialogue, you know? <laughs> It's and, words yeah. coming out and of it's the long and it's a very long scene. Right. right. And there's yeah. words coming out of the character's mouth. But uh, where's where's the actual interest? What's going to actually keep people involved and caring about what's going on? It's often not the dialogue. It's often like, what's the reaction of the character? You know? Yeah. Yeah. What is someone thinking? Yeah. Right. List, active listening is always the most interesting thing in a scene to me. Mm -hmm. I love How that. does someone actively listen or not listen? Right. Yeah. Or ignore what they're hearing. Yeah. So. And what's also going on with the people around them, you know? Right. Um, right. I love Rear Window. It's one of my favorite films. And, you know, it's all about this guy watching everybody else, you know? <laughs> right, right. Um, from his window. And, and what it, it, they're all extensions of him, you know? And, right, right. Uh, and what right. he needs and to learn from life. And what he assumes is, is, yes. Yeah, he has his assumptions. Yeah. yeah. Right. And he also has his... Uh, he can't see himself because he's not. he doesn't have the, you know, the lens focused on himself. But he starts to. You know, yeah. yeah, when he becomes the focus. So, yeah, hmm. fantastic, interesting, uh, fantastic cool. story. So, yeah, there are pitches 11 through 15 of 15 pitches. 15 pitches from 100. From 100. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Amazing. Well, good luck with this. Thank you. I hope it I hope it continues you on your on your journey to uh, making something a reality. I really think it will. You know, it's just um, the bus keeps coming around. And once I have the right fare, I can get on it pretty much. <laughs> <laughs> so, You know, I often I often think that it really is about about continuing to engage mm -hmm. as an artist. And there is going to become a moment where someone says yes. Yep. And then you and then you've got to be ready. Yeah. For that yes, right? You've got to be able to step up to that plate and make Absolutely. that yes into something. Yep. Right? Manifest that yes. Yeah. So and it may come sooner than later. It you sounds know? like there are some things happening. So good luck with it. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. And until next time, I hope we all get a little wiser. Thank you for watching the Directing Animation Livecast, hosted by Scott Weiser, audio version edited by Kira Horowitz, copyright Scott Weiser, LLC 2023. Don't forget to subscribe on YouTube and ring that notification bell.